Okay, so we are talking about the Romanesque. You should have already watched the intro video, and now we are going to talk about architecture in the Romanesque period in Western Europe. Um, first, we're going to talk about Saint Etienne. So, Saint Etienne, this is uh, in France. Um, this is in the Champagne region of France. Um, basically, this has a relationship to the basilica um, floor plan of early Christian churches. So we looked at St. Peter's, remember? And then we looked at a few other examples. Um, so this is taken from the Roman idea of a basilica, which in Roman times was a secular building, right? So it was like an administrative hall, kind of like a city hall. Um, but during the Byzantine era, the basilican plan and then the central plan are the two main kind of floor plans that we see for churches at the beginning of Christianity, right? Um, so in the Romanesque period, the basilican plan really wins out. So that means we have kind of a rectangular shape. <coughs> Excuse me, we have it which has a nave, as you can see from the floor plan up here. And then we have our aisle, our aisles on either side of the nave. Um, we have the apse, which is kind of the rounded place at the back, which gets broken down into the choir, which is where the altar is. Um, and then we have radiating chapels, which in um, French Romanesque architecture are called chevets. We also have, as the aisle goes up around the back of the choir into the apse, that um, is no longer called an aisle, it's called an ambulatory. We saw the word ambulatory in central plan uh, layouts for churches that we looked at earlier. We still have our narthex, which is kind of our entryway, kind of the foyer into the church. And then as we learned about in the Etonian, uh, Carolingian and uh, Etonian empires and early Christian building, we have our west work. So the west work is where we have our two towers in the front that go on either side of the narthex. And this becomes kind of the general layout um, of churches in this time period. Oh, I, pardon me. We also have the transept, which is something that the Romans didn't have on their basilica floor plans. This is added later. So the transept um, is perpendicular to the nave and aisles, which makes the form of this floor plan look like a cross, which is thematically appropriate because it's a Christian building, right? Um, the Transept often have entries at either end of the transept, and those have a porch, which become more and more elaborate. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. The area where the transept and the nave cross, that space that, that makes kind of a square there, that is called the crossing. That becomes important because later that becomes the kind of unit of measurement for how uh, the space within the church is, is measured and designed. Um, anywhere you see an X on this map means that there's a groin vault, okay? So lots of groin vaults, which are aesthetically um, interesting looking, but they're also, remember, very structurally important, okay? All right, so um, we have a relationship here between the three-story timber churches that we see in the Etonian era. We still see alternating support systems inside. Um, we also see um, our apps developed at the end. Let's look uh, at the interior of a different example. So looking at the interior, this is not Saint Etienne, this is uh, Saint Philibert and uh, Tormu. And so here you can see those rounded arches, you can see the groin vaults in the aisles, you can see our big support columns and down into the apps at the end. Um, Radiating chapels, so if we go back to the slide here on the back of the apse, these little half circles that come out, which I, again are also called chevettes, um, those are smaller chapels, other places for people to worship, which becomes important during pilgrimage because there's just so much traffic, there's so many people coming in. Um, the radiating chapels also are often where the relics are housed. So we talked about relics in the, in the intro to this unit. Those are like the bones or possessions of saints or other holy figures that people would come to pay tribute to, right? Those would often be in the radiating chapels. Um, they could be viewed without having to enter the choir where the main altar stood. So pilgrims could come even during a surf service and walk up and just go around 
up the aisle around the ambulatory into those radiating chapels to see the specific items that they wanted to see. Okay, uh, St. Vicente and St. Philibert both are good examples of the Romanesque stone vaulting system. So remember the vaulting inside. So we have barrel vaults in the center above the nave, and then we have growing vaults above the aisles. Um, this is a little more advanced than Etienne, uh, but Etienne was the first to incorporate stone sculpture, which becomes a defining feature of the Romanesque a little bit later on. Um, we only see stone, stone sculpture at Etienne in the, the capitals of the columns. Okay, let's look at Toulouse. So Saint-Sernan Toulouse, this is an image that you want to remember because it's one that I definitely have on the final and I think also on your quiz for this unit, people in my class. Um, okay, one problem that we have with these ceilings that have timber roofs that we see early on in the Romanesque before they start doing all the vaulting and everything is that they burn down. There's lots of candles, timber is wood, wood burns, so it becomes a problem. So we start seeing more and more use of stone and stone vaulting for ceilings. Um, Toulouse uh, is kind of dwarfing the, the previous two churches that we just looked at. Saint Sonan, which is uh, French for Saint uh, Saturnius at Toulouse. It's, um, the building here is begun in 1070 and takes over 100 years, or around 100 years to complete. Not quite 100 years, 1120, I think. Uh, so it's named for the city's first bishop. So his name is Saturnius, and he's the first bishop assigned to the city. He is martyred in the third century. So this then becomes an important pilgrimage stop. What does martyred mean? It means you're killed for your faith. So a lot of saints became saints because they died for their Christian uh, faith. So this is one of those words that martyr that comes up um, in this time period a lot. Okay, it has a typical plan of a pilgrimage church. This becomes an important pilgrimage site. It is uh, one of the stops on the four roads that go to Santiago uh, at de Compostela in Spain, which I talked about in the introduction. Um, and this kind of defines some of, of what we see becoming Romanesque changes to the basic basilica layout. So the first one is they increase the length of the nave. So the nave becomes very, very long so more people can fit in it. The second is they double the side aisles. So we see wider side aisles or doubled side aisles, in this case doubled. So you can see there's two aisles next to each other divided by a row of columns. Okay, um, so increase the length of the nave, double the side aisles, adding a transept. The transept, remember, is that part that crosses the nave, right? Um, they also add an ambulatory. The ambulatory is there at the end, which goes around to where the um, chapels, the radiating chapels are. Also, you'll notice that the radiating chapels go all the way out along the transept, so adding even more radiating chapels, um, which is more, all of this is done to, to provide more space for pilgrims who are coming here to worship. So let's review those things. Increase the length of the nave, double the side aisles, add the transept, add an, added an ambulatory and added radiating chapels. So these are the um, additions that come about during the Romanesque period to the original Roman Basilica plan for church, for which was for administrative buildings, but then gets adopted in the Byzantine as a church plan that make it them bigger so that they can accommodate more traffic from the pilgrims, right? Okay, so one of the other things that we see is we have a kind of um, geometric design that's based on this measurement of the crossing. Crossing is where our transept crosses our nave. So that unit becomes important for determining the space between everything. So all of it is based on the crossing square. For example, each bay, these are bays, there's 12 in the nave, each bay uh, in the nave is one half of the crossing square, okay? And each side aisle is one fourth the crossing square square. So each one of these little um, units within the side aisles is one quarter of the crossing. Remember every time you see an X on here that's a groin vault. So this also doubling the aisle with all these additional groin vaults 
makes it more stable. Also, you'll notice that our aisle comes up along our transept now. So we have our ambulatory up here, but we also have an aisle around the transept. So that's just adding more and more space. Um, okay, we also have tribunes over the aisles for overflow of visitors. So you look at the interior view up here in this kind of second story gallery level. We have spaces where people can sit during worship if they want. Uh, this is also featured at Santiago de Compostela in Spain. Um, we have barrel vaults in the nave, so structurally important, and we have this ribbing of the, bar the barrel vault that goes down through the engaged columns all the way down into the support system, which is structurally significant. Um, the groin vaults, like I said, are in the aisles and uh, the tribunes above, which, which add for structural support. They absorb all that pressure and weight because this is very heavy and has a stone ceiling. We've engaged columns, which are decorative, but also ha have a support function. We have compound piers, which means we don't just have one pilaster. We have multiple pilasters together around a pier. A pier is a column, but uh, rectangular. Um, we also have uh, the springing, so this is where from the uh, engaged columns and pilasters we have the structural support going up into the ribbing and carrying through along the vault. Um, we also have transverse arches that span the nave, so these are our transverse arches uh, ribbing there. The weight basically goes up through the compound piers to the engaged columns to the springing through the transverse arches and back down. So you can see how everything is supported here in a structural way. Um, the articulation of this is echoed on the exterior. Okay, so when we look at the exterior, hang on, go back, you can see these engaged buttresses. So these buttresses are supporting all the way along the nave where you'd have the springing going up into the transverse arches. We have buttresses supporting that. Okay. Okay. Another feature we have is a crossing tower. That's added a little bit later, but we start seeing those become uh, a feature of many churches and cathedrals at this time. Um, okay, so all of this basically um, looks like a repeating geometric shape all the way down the nave and on the exterior of the building. Um, Saint Sernan also has one of the early, earliest series of a large Romanesque relief sculpture. We have seven marble slabs of relief sculpture on the interior. Okay, so... Um, Oops, sorry, I'm losing my place in my notes, I apologize. Okay, uh, this is Cluny. So um, basically we have this kind of competitive spirit between um, all of these different cities along the pilgrimage routes. who are trying to build bigger and better uh, churches for people to come to uh, on these routes. And, and they figured the bigger, the better, the more glory to God, the more thankful you're showing to, um, you know, Christian God and also to draw in tourists, essentially pilgrims on the, on the pilgrimage routes. So the primary patrons other than the individual cities in the Romanesque period were monks of the Cluniac order. Okay, and the Cluniac order starts in 909 when a duke donates a bunch of land near the city of Cluny. So Cluniac is named after the city of Cluny. Um, this is in the Burgundy region of France. Um, and he donates this to a group of Benedictine monks who are reformists. So they want to change the kind of rules of the Benedictine monks and create their own thing. So that's where we get the Cluniac order of monks. Their leader is a guy named Berno of Baum. So the Duke is a liege lord. He waves his rights to the land and gives it to the monks, um, probably because he did something bad and he wants to get in good with God, maybe. Or maybe he was just being a good guy. I don't know. Um, then the uh, abbot's only boss is the pope. The pope is all the way over in Italy, right? So they kind of can govern themselves. They don't have any official guy watching over what they're doing because their liege lord forfeited his rights to the land to them. So Berno founds this new order of monks 
and they become very famous for their art and for their music. A bunch of creative, kind of a crea creative uh, hub happening here. They build a whole series of churches at Cluny, each one more elaborate than the last, and they build them higher and higher and higher. The third church at Cluny is started by Abbot Hugh of Sinner. Um, Abbot Hugh, Hugh, well, that's just kind of funny to me, Abbot Hugh, I don't know why. Anyway, okay, so in 1088, uh, Hugh starts work on Cluny III. Okay, so this is the third iteration of this huge church. This is mostly destroyed today, which is too bad because by all accounts it was pretty spectacular in its day. They finished it in only 42 years, so it's finished in 1130. Um, when it was done, it was the largest church in Europe. It retained that stat for 500 years until the new St. Peter's was built. <coughs> excuse, <coughs> excuse me. By the way, other than being the seat of the Pope, um, I can't remember if I told you why St. Peter's was such a big pilgrimage site in the intro. Um, from the Bible, there's a line uh, called, on this rock I will build, on this rock I will build my church. Um, that is a direct reference to St. Peter. So uh, St. Peter is, is um, buried under the site of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, supposedly. Okay, anyway, uh, St. Peter's is finished in the 17th century and then the biggest is the biggest church, but Cluny III what, um, is the biggest church for like 500 years. Okay, anyway, anyway. It has four massive aisles. It has tons of radiated, radiating chapels. And one thing you notice, if you look here at this cross section, is its arches are a little bit pointy. This is kind of foreshadowing what comes next, which is the Gothic movement, okay? The nave was 500 feet long, so super, super long. It was 100 feet high, 100 feet high, fully vaulted nave, 50% greater than um, St. Sernan, and it was this kind of symbol of power and prestige for the Cluniac order. Um, it collapses eventually, okay? So it's, it's pretty destroyed. Uh, okay, so let's look at another example. This is... Um, St. Etienne, uh, which is in Cannes. This is another church that is on the pilgrimage route. Here's the exterior. You can see the west work. So it has the, the two towers next to each other like that, uh, which is a holdover, of course, from the Carolinian and Ottonian era. Um, we also see that we have... I feel like I have another like little note about this somewhere, but maybe I don't. Do, 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 do. Okay, um, we also have on the interior a new feature in the nave. What is the feature? Groin vaults, right? So instead of just having a barrel vault, we have complex groin vaults. They all have that feature of the springing coming up into the ribs of the vault, which would have been the, the transverse arches. In this case, they're transverse, but they go into a center and kind of go out, so it's more structurally sound. We have bundled, engaged columns that are supporting the springing and through the ribbing into the groin vaults, um, which makes this even more strong structurally in, term of, in terms of its supports. Um, then let's hop over and see what's happening in England. So this is Durham Cathedral, which, hang on, sorry. Okay, uh, so Normandy in England right? Normandy is in Spain. They have a long history. So um, we're just looking at St. Etienne, which is in Cannes. It's an abbey church. Uh, the Normans settled, uh, were settled, this, this area, the Normans were settlers, were Christian Vikings, basically, right? Um, and St. Etienne in uh, Cannes is begun by William of Normandy. This is a famous guy at this time. His name is William the Conqueror. You may have heard of him. So he's a pretty important figure during this time period. And he starts this church in um, 1067. Uh, 20 years later, he is buried there. So he's actually buried in Saint-Étienne. 
uh, William the Conqueror. It's, the design is rooted in this Etonian and Carolingian westwork design. Um, and then we have these four large buttresses dividing the outside groin vaults all up and down the nave, which are six partites. They are six part groin vaults. We have a uh, tripartite design in the vertical and horizontal way that the layout is done. And the vaults are high enough to provide clear story windows. So lots and lots of light can come in through these windows up here in the clear story. So this is the tripartite elevation and up at the top, the third part is the clear story. Okay, lots of light, light airy quality. Okay, on the other side of the um, English Channel, we have Durham Cathedral in England. William of Normandy, William the Conqueror, has a conquest of England in 1066 and begins this new era in England. Um, he also brought over Norman architecture at this time, including this church, which is begun in 1093. Uh, inside, you'll notice we have grain vaults. We see some similarities here to William the Conqueror churches. Um, so these are seven part vaults and each of them cover two bays. Uh, the pillars are ornamented with these kind of abstract designs that are carved into them, this sort of chevron design, which is something new and is a particularly English kind of uh, look. Think of all these masons who had to cut these precise stones to make all of these churches. Think of all the hard um, artisanal workers doing this. We also have slightly pointy arches and ribbed groin vaults. Both of those things are things that are very important in the Gothic um, period, which is the next thing that we'll study. So we have this kind of segue into the Gothic with uh, Normandy and England at this time. Um, we have these quadrant arches on the buttresses. They're a precursor to what become um, flying buttresses in the Gothic. Also in England, we're still seeing illuminated manuscripts, which we'll talk about in the painting section of this lecture. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about Romanesque sculpture.